Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 644 for the 11th of Elul in a regular year. So by Hashgacha Protest, I happened to listen to a podcast this morning in which there were two psychologists, or at least two very psychologically minded people. One of them was definitely a psychologist and they were critiquing the organization Landmark. If anybody's familiar with Landmark, Landmark is this like self-help program that is a three day long program, a very intensive program where people go to have this like self transformative experience where the, the program really claims that in three days you can really get out of your rut. You can come to this, like transform your relationships, your, uh, your outlook on life, your career, whatever is holding you back. It's a, it, it makes a lot of claims. And anyways, the podcast was really interesting. One of the guys actually attended one day of Landmark. They did a lot of research into it and they did, you know, they didn't want to bash it entirely. They said that, you know, they're very aware that, uh, that good things do come about from it. And even some of you, my listeners, maybe some of you have gone to Landmark yourself. Maybe you know people that have gone to Landmark and have had very positive experiences. I've never actually gone. So I'm only speaking from the secondhand knowledge. But from what my understanding of it is it makes these really bold claims. And the idea of what they were kind of talking about in the podcast is that it doesn't really do as much as as you think it's going to do. Uh, and it's kind of impossible for, for it to do that. Like it, the claim on the website supposedly is that 94% of participants experience these radical shifts and transformations in their life. And that's kind of not possible. The psychologist on there was actually talking about how even in standard therapy, it's like the amount of actual transformation that happens to a person is very slight. It's not that great. And so today we're actually going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about this idea of transformation, this idea of affecting change, not only in ourselves, but actually in the universe, because everything we do affects the universe around us, affects the world in which we live. And today we're really going to be talking about the positive effects that our actions have on the universe. And we're going to talk about the difference between how some types of actions that we do can have a kind of temporal effect on the universe. And some of the action that we do can have a much more permanent or stronger or everlasting effect on the universe. So like when people go to Landmark, maybe they go and they feel this like great inspiration for a couple days after, you know, but how many of them, I wonder... 10 years down the line, how many of them really still feel these same profound effects? I don't know, again, because I'm not an expert in the subject, but my feeling um, would be not that many because the amount of change that you can do in a three-day seminar where most of the seminar is really just sitting around and listening to people lecture at you, it's, it's like, it's limited versus what we're going to be learning about today is really the only way to affect real change in yourself and in the universe around you is through work is through good, hard work. So while quick fixes may seem really appealing at first glance, and while just capitalizing on what you're good at might feel really good and rewarding at first glance. So yesterday, if you listen to the episode yesterday, I I started out in the introduction talking about this very naturally flexible girl who showed up at a contortion class at my teacher's contortion class. And so, and at first it was like, kind of like this, like mesmerizing, like, oh, wow, it's not fair. It's everything comes so easy to her. Like she doesn't even have to work for this. So while yes, that's very appealing at first glance, it turned out that this same girl was actually not very strong. It was actually not very stable. And God forbid, if she didn't actually work on, uh, on really working and on really doing the work and putting in the work, she could, God forbid, end up injuring herself. And she actually would not get very far. It might be very 
nice, like kind of like as a quick fix, like, oh, wow, she can do that one little pose and it looks really good. But could she really do a whole show of this? I, I'm doubtful that she could because she wouldn't necessarily have the control involved in this. So that brings us to today's Tanya. And today's Tanya, we're actually going to be concluding this discussion that we began at the beginning of the epistle, which was based on this pasuk that looked at Staka and it showed us two different effects that Staka can have. And each one of them was associated with a slightly different wording. There was the idea of Maisa Hatstaka, the action of Tzaka, which was associated with bringing about peace. And then there was the idea of the uh, Avoda Hatstaka, the work of Tzaka, the service of Tzaka, which was associated with bringing about quiet and, um, and something more permanent. And so we started talking yesterday about this idea of this, the action of stuck and how that brings about peace. And we've talked about what peace means in previous episodes where, uh, where we talked about peace is the harmony of opposites it's of chesed and gvora and all of that. And how the ultimate peace really comes about from God, because God is above both of these forces. And that's associated with God's mita of compassion of Rahmanas, because that's kind of like a more essential element that transcends the others. Um, and then yesterday we talked about this idea of how this the idea of maise maise is an action it's something that is it, it connotes a kind of perpetuality to it and something that is constantly being done in a very natural way and we talked about how this is associated with the giving of staka in a natural way the way that jews naturally give naturally are compassionate we're very compassionate giving people and then we started talking about this idea of the work of tzedakah and how and the contrast with that, what it means to work versus to just do something naturally. And we said that working really means actually toiling, going against your nature, going over and above your nature, whether we're talking about praying, whether we're talking about giving tzedakah, whatever it is, is that we're pushing ourselves beyond our limits. And so today we're going to conclude this discussion and we're going to bring it all together. And we're going to bring it back to this whole idea as to where, where does the the quiet fit in and where does the everlasting aspect fit in where does this idea of how um what why do we associate this toil this avoda satsaka specifically with the idea of of quietude and specifically with the idea of some type of everlasting effect and so i think the best way to go about this is to get right into the text now and to see how the ultra rubber breaks all of this down and again for context we are in igaris hakodesh and we are concluding Epistle 12 today. So the Alter Rebbe begins by reminding us again of this Pasuk that we started out this Epistle with, which is from Yeshayahu chapter 32 verse 17, where it says, mm-hmm. So again, to translate that, that, and it was that the action of Tzedaka is peace, and the avodas at staka, the work or toil or service of staka, is quiet, sheket, and surety forever and ever. So, okay, so what is this about? So the altar rabbit begins today, and he says he says the first part of that pasuk. So it says that 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 staka is called maise, and it's not called avoda. And what we learn from that is that even the even the aspect of staka, which is called maise, the action of staka, like this more natural kind of giving of staka, nevertheless, it causes this arousal from below. Like when a person gives staka in this more natural way, it causes an arousal above, and a sarusa dilatata causes an arusa dilatata, and it reveals reveals the light, the infinite light of God with a great radiance and a great influx, a great influence. And it creates peace in the higher realms as we spoke about. So we spoke about this in uh, a couple of episodes ago that, that there is something just the mere act of giving staka, even if it's just natural, it feels good to you. It's not, you're not over and above your, your nature or anything that causes, um, peace in the world it affects peace in the world and uh and it does this above and it also does this in the terrestrial realms below uh and the only thing is when we say that it affects the terrestrial realms below here we do know that in our world our lowly world this true peace and this uh this refinement that happens of the good from the bad will not be revealed until the end of times and not during Exile, as we spoke about above. So we spoke about this already, right? That it's like, okay, so we're affecting this piece. We know every time you give a piece, a little bit of stucca, it's causing this like shaking up of the realms and this piece happens. That's amazing, but you don't see that. And it's not, we're not going to see it until the end of times. And 
even, and we do see it, okay, a little bit when we say we look at man, when you look at yourself, who's an olam katan, a small world, um, during certain auspicious times like prayer, for example, then you could maybe experience it a little bit. There's this idea of that with tzedek, you will see, I will see your face that we said, but tzedek hazef anecha, as we spoke about above. So, right, there is times during prayer that you might feel this arousal. You do get that feeling of like some kind of like inner peace, inner tr- tr- tranquility kind of. But then what happens is, okay, you prayed, you had this ecstatic experience, this amazing connection with God, you felt really good and you had that sense, that little taste of peace, then you stop praying. Uh Uh-oh, now the negativity can come back to you and that that bad can come and can wake up um, and it can still reawaken in an easy, it's easy for it to reawaken and to be attached to good. You didn't affect any kind of everlasting change um, when you go about in the darkness of the world. So again, to bring it back to to that analogy of landmark, people go to landmark, they have these amazing experiences or even, you know, other times people will go on these like health retreats or seminars or whatever. They get really fired up. They get really inspired. That's amazing. That's awesome. That's so good. What happens? They come back into the world a few days later. Hmm. It's not so simple. It's it's easy to be enlightened when you're in this like very enclosed, like um, sanitized environment. It's another thing to keep that with you when you go out into the world. Okay, so all of that is when we're talking about this idea of the action of tzedakah, the maisa tzedakah. But now, what about if we talk about tzedakah in a way of avoda, in a way of service? So when we, so since this this aspect of the service of tzedakah is much more precious and much more lofty, then uh, to the point that why? Why is it so much more precious and lofty? Because as we spoke about, it's like where you're actually going to be going, um, you're nullifying your nature and your will, your your physical will in the face of the nature of God. This causes the sitra ahra to be subjugated. So it's like, again, everything we do has a mirror in like a, a bigger way. And so what happens is that you that you subjugate your yitzhar, you're nullifying your will, and this causes the subjugation of the evil forces in the world in general. And this causes the uh the 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 preciousness of God, of the Holy One Blessed Be He to spread forth and become manifest in all the worlds. So uh, like the superiority of light over darkness. This is from Echa chapter 2, verse 13. So it's like this idea basically that it's like when you work and when you toil, what's happening is you're revealing this light that's so much deeper, so much more profound um, than anything else because because specifically because of the subjugation of your will that's involved. And because this is such an intense thing, then the evil cannot come back and wake up in such an easy way uh, on its own, the way that it would have been able to before when we were just talking about that level of the Maisat Staka, but rather only if a person goes back and, and like does it intentionally, if a person goes back and intentionally arouses the evil within them, yes, okay, they will be able to do that but it won't come up on its own. So that's a pretty intense statement, right? And this is why we can now understand this thing where it says, Hashket adulam, that the avodah satstaka causes the, the quietness and surety forever and ever. So why quietness? So this is a very interesting thing, is that if we look at the word sheket in Hebrew, it comes from the same etymology as the word shoket, which means um, to rest. And it's if you look at in Yermiyahu chapter 48, verse 11, we see this word come up where it says shoket al shmarav, that he rests on his dregs. Meaning to say, what does that mean, dregs? Rest on the dregs. So it's like, let's say if you have like a uh, wine. So there's like the sediment in the wine. And the wine and the sediment in the wine, if you ever looked at a uh, at wine, the sediment falls to the bottom and it gets separated from the wine. It goes all the way down to the bottom. And the wine above is totally pure and totally clear. So this is what happens. The same thing is with the service of tzedakah. That what happens is, what are the dregs in the service of tzedakah that we're talking about? This is the admixture of of negativity, of, of evil that's found in a person's soul. And this gets separated and extracted a little bit here, um, slightly, slightly, slowly, slowly, until it comes down, goes down and, and falls. Like it's like it gets pulled downwards to its source because its source is down below. And this is, as it says, uh, this is from Micha chapter 7, verse, um, verse 19. And you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So, so meaning that the, the place of the sins, this place of negativity is in the lower places, is in down below. 
And so that is really what happens is that basically just like the sediment of w- uh, in wine falls to the bottom and that's kind of what eventually ends up happening. This is what happens when we engage in the avoda setzaka, when we engage in that toil, then it then the, the evil really goes down below. It loses its power over us. So that's it for the section. That's it for the epistle. So just to sum it up and bring it all together. So again, so why is it that these quick fixes don't work? Why is it that it's, it can't be, why can't it be easy? Why can't we just like give stucca, you know, give when we feel like giving even, you know, maybe even on a daily basis, we give a little bit, we give according to our nature. We go in line with our nature, just it, rejoice in the fact that we're giving people and you know, and that that can bring about this great change in the universe. Yes, it can to a certain extent, but it's it's going to be temporal and it's not going to be full and it's not going to be everlasting versus when, and, and it's, it's still given an opening to like not being so sustainable when you go out into the world versus if you really work on yourself, if you really go over and above your natural giving nature and you give more than you're used to. If you put your whole self into prayer, you don't just pray in the morning because you have to pray, but you really pray with your whole heart and soul in a full, full and complete way. This is going to push away the evil, just like the sediment falling to the bottom of the wine. And it's going to create not just peace, but it's actually going to create so, uh, quiet in the world and quiet within yourself uh, in a more everlasting and more permanent way. So the bottom line is there's no quick fixes. If you want to work on, if you want to change, you have to work at it. You have to work on yourself. Nothing substitutes hard work. So that's it for today. And tomorrow we will begin a new epistle. So stay tuned and I'll speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast, hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Benyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistot.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.